there is a major attack right now centered on this most correct book of scripture. When you open the Book of Mormon, when you read those words, are you reading a book of inspired scripture? Or are you reading the words of a man who committed war crimes, a man who dehumanized the population of the Lamanites and committed genocide? Are you reading the words of a murderer? Or are you reading the words of a prophet, a righteous, inspired prophet of God? And Mormon is putting this in there to say, you know what? All of these false ideas that were among the Nephites are going to be in your day as well, just like Nephi says. And everybody's going to get duped by it, even the humble followers of Christ. So we're giving you a book where we're going to show you, here's what the false ideas are. Here's how to combat them. Here you go. The solution is sitting right here. Do we have any idea of the gift that we have. Do we look at the Book of Mormon realizing this priceless treasure we're literally holding in our hands? Today we are continuing to move through 2 Nephi, and in these chapters, Nephi exposes some of the enemies of Jesus Christ in our day but it gives us the solutions. So let's go ahead here and start in 2 Nephi chapter 26, verses 3 through 7. So here, Nephi is speaking of the heartache and the pain that he feels knowing the history of his people. Remember, Nephi saw it all in vision, and he saw his people reject the light. He saw them become destroyed And he saw the terrible destructions that would happen specifically before Jesus Christ came. In verse 3, we read, quote, And after the Messiah shall come, there shall be signs given unto my people of his birth, and also of his death and resurrection. And great and terrible shall that day be unto the wicked, for they shall perish. And they shall perish because, now listen to this, this is key, Why were the wicked destroyed in the Nephites' day? Well, we find out here. He says they perish because they cast out the prophets and the saints and stone them and slay them. Wherefore, the cry of the blood of the saints shall ascend up to God from the ground against them. A few verses later, Nephi actually emphasizes this again. He says, and they that kill the prophets and the saints, the depths of the earth shall swallow them up, saith the Lord of hosts, and mountains shall cover them and whirlwinds shall carry them away. Remember the crazy destructions that happened in the Book of Mormon. We read about them in 3rd Nephi where entire cities sank into the sea or were buried. Well, Nephi saw this and he talks about it. He says, buildings shall fall upon them and crush them to pieces and grind them to powder. And of course, I mean, imagine Nephi's perspective looking at this. These are his descendants. These are his kids. He says, oh, the pain and the anguish of my soul for the loss of the slain of my people. For I, Nephi, have seen it and it well nigh consumeth me before the presence of the Lord. But I must cry unto my God, thy ways are just. Nephi saw his day, and he also saw us, and he knew that there were parallels. He knew that the same, the cause of the same destruction of his people in in the Book of Mormon time period would be the same cause of destruction of Latter-day Israel and the world in our day. The crowning event of the Book of Mormon is the coming of Jesus Christ. But right before his coming is this great wickedness and then destructions. It's the same in our day. The central message of our day is that we are looking forward to and anticipating the second coming of Jesus Christ, just as the Nephites were looking forward to the coming of Christ in their day. But before his coming in our day, just like in the Nephites, there will be the same wickedness and then destruction. Now, we all know this. You might be sitting there thinking, come on, Hannah, this isn't rocket science. We know this. So why do we need the Book of Mormon? Well, we need the Book of Mormon because the Book of Mormon has the details. The Book of Mormon has how to prepare, the sequence of things, how to navigate, and how to be safe. 
2 Nephi 26, 8 gives us a key fundamental parallel. He says, quote, But behold, the righteous that hearken unto the words of the prophets and destroy them not, but look forward unto Christ with steadfastness for the signs which are given, notwithstanding all persecution, right? It's going to be hard. It is not going to be easy to follow the prophets and look for the signs, but they are they which shall not perish. The son of righteousness shall appear unto them and he shall heal them and they shall have peace with him, end quote. So who makes it through the last days? Those who don't reject the prophets. In lesson nine, we talked about the teachings of the prophets for our day that are unpopular. They're teachings that maybe most of us don't want to hear. We don't want to hear the things that we are doing wrong and the compromises that we are making. But I just want to bear my testimony to you that I know those men were inspired. I know the counsel that they gave on fatherhood, on masculinity, on standards of music and dress and movies and literature, of politics, of government, of liberty, all of these teachings from the prophets on health, on education. They were men who were inspired. I know this for myself and you can know it as well. And I want to give you my testimony that if you will turn to them and you will listen, you will be able to, you and your children will be like those Nephites that were preserved before the coming of Jesus Christ in their day. Those who did not stone the prophets, those who hearkened to them. They are those who will be healed and those who will have peace, as Nephi says. But unfortunately, Nephi says that most in our day are going to reject. In 2 Nephi chapter 27, 5, he says, quote, For behold, the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep. For behold, ye have closed your eyes, Ye have rejected the prophets and your rulers, and the seers hath he covered because of your iniquity. End quote. These are strong and bold warnings, but they're warnings out of love because the Lord wants us to know if we want to be healed and if we want to be safe, this is the way to do it. All of these other strategies and shortcuts and alliances, they don't work. They'll fail you in the end. So Nephi continues here, and he explains that the Book of Mormon specifically is the tool that will shatter the deep sleep that we as a people find ourselves under. In 2 Nephi chapter 27, verse 6, we find, quote, And it shall come to pass that the Lord God shall bring forth unto you the words of a book, and they shall be the words of them which have slumbered, right? The Nephite prophets. And then in verse 7, and behold, the book shall be sealed and in the book shall be a revelation from God from the beginning of the world to the ending thereof, end quote. So then Nephi talks about the witnesses of the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith, um, some prophecies of Martin Harris and taking the characters to Dr. Anthon. And of course, that prophecy also has multiple fulfillments, but he's basically talking about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Now, why are we talking about this? We like the Book of Mormon. I mean, let's be honest. That's why we're even listening or I'm recording this podcast. We're talking about it because there is a major attack right now centered on this most correct book of scripture. I'm going to play a clip here from a fireside that was given, a Latter-day Saint fireside by Terrell and Fiona Givens. They are two very popular scholars within the church. They're members of the church. They have books at Desert Book. They've worked with BYU Projects, etc. But they are promoting a new interpretation of the Book of Mormon and specifically the character of Mormon. I want you to listen to how they describe the character of Mormon, the compiler of the Book of Mormon. And I want you to think, what are the implications of this worldview? I think it helps us understand more some of the um, the disquieting language we find in the Book of Mormon, um, apart from the fact that it was also edited by a general who was in a war committing genocide. So that you know, just the ed- looking at the, the the life and the of the editor of the Book of Mormon himself is going okay that he's going to spend a lot of attention on war and he's going to make very clear distinctions between black and white. 
Generals mm. don't understand nuance, especially if they're engaged in that type of a warfare. You have to have Absolutely. the enemy as, yeah, as portrayed as non-human or un subhuman and that you were valiant. Um, and, and so when you put all of these things together, then for me anyway, it sort of broadens the whole horizon. It broadens the perspective and helps me feel more comfortable. We're talking with human beings and try God is trying to converse with them. And that's very difficult. When you open the Book of Mormon, when you read those words, are you reading a book of inspired scripture? Or are you reading the words of a man who committed war crimes, a man who dehumanized the population of the Lamanites and committed genocide? Are you reading the words of a murderer? Or are you reading the words of a prophet, a righteous, inspired prophet of God? And if you believe that Mormon was this man who was frankly wicked and biased and a product of his times and and entrenched in this murderous culture of his day, what implications does that have for the Book of Mormon? What implications does that have when Mormon talks about Amalekiah and secret combinations or when he highlights political principles? Is the Book of Mormon trustworthy? And it's not just the givens. Claudia Bushman, who is the wife of Richard Bushman, who is the author of Rough Stone Rolling, wrote a paper called I, Nephi. And in this paper, Claudia Bushman promotes the idea that Nephi was a wounded and resentful man who downplayed his father's goodness and tried to downplay his father as a prophet. She talks about how Nephi tries to justify violence and crime in the name of God because he wants to convince us in these chapters that essentially 1st and 2nd Nephi are the biased and distorted viewpoint of a man who was trying to prove himself and convince us that he spoke for God. She says there is much room to doubt Nephi's story and that we don't always approve of his behavior. She says, I do not question Nephi's story as generally true and factual, but he, like every other writer, has manipulated the record. So what is this viewpoint of scripture? It's essentially, if you go read 1 Nephi, let's be careful here. This guy isn't really giving us the real story. He's giving us something through his lens, and his lens is biased, and it's manipulative, and he has an agenda. Remember, this is coming from a member of the church. This is a paper um, written from the viewpoint of someone who is considered by many to be a faithful member of the church. This is a new progressive view of scripture, and I would submit an attack on the Book of Mormon as scripture. Um, Claudia Bushman also talks about how, you know, Nephi needs to establish his authority and he doesn't leave hope for retrieving the lost group. He presents himself as the chosen one, even while he's writing in anger and sorrow that poor Laman and Lemuel, you know, they were just not allowed to tell their own tale. They were, quote, damned from the beginning by their arrogant pen wielding brother, right? So Nephi's over here. He's arrogant. He's vengeful. He... Um, is manipulative. And then here's poor Laman and Lemuel. They just didn't get a chance to tell their story. They get no respect, she says. When Nephi speaks, he has to be right. Laman and Lemuel were not that bad, she says, but Nephi makes them look as bad as he can. Now you may be thinking, okay, whoa, this, this is really crazy. Um, we don't believe this and this is not popular. But you would be surprised how popular this narrative is becoming among our youth and among our students, the Generation Z, even some of the millennials and, and the younger generations. This is the new perspective that is being pushed at universities, including Brigham Young University. I have a friend who was just taking a class last semester, and she began sending me some of the material, and I... I wasn't shocked in the sense that I knew this narrative was being promoted. I knew it was out there. But just hearing her tell the stories of how Jacob and Enos are racist and how the Book of Mormon is not accurate history and its viewpoint is not correct 
all the time and it's doctrine and it's history and we've got to be careful and we basically downplaying the Book of Mormon and saying the Book of Mormon is no longer trustworthy scripture and it needs to be deconstructed and torn apart. It just reminded me that we are in a war and it's a war for the battle of the souls of our children. And the Lord knows and the devil knows that the Book of Mormon is key in winning this war. And that is why there is an attack being focused on this book of scripture. If we go back to 2 Nephi chapter 27, verse 26, Nephi says, guys, this Book of Mormon is a marvelous work and it's a work to help save you. In other words, if we're treating it as a biased, manipulative history that's not accurate, we are literally throwing away the tool God gave us for our solution. The Lord says, quote, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, yea, a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise and learned shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent shall be hid. In the next chapter, he says, and the things which shall be written out of the book, the Book of Mormon, shall be of great worth unto the children of men and especially unto our seed, which is a remnant of the house of Israel. This perspective is diametrically opposed to the perspective of Terrell and Fiona Givens, Claudia Bushman, and so many other progressive writers. Satan is attacking the Book of Mormon because he knows the Book of Mormon is the solution in our day, and he wants to get rid of it as quickly as possible. So what do we need to be saved from? What is the Book of Mormon trying to solve? Well, in 2 Nephi 28, 9, it talks about how one of the chief threats in our day is false and foolish doctrine. It is false ideas, false philosophies in our day that are far greater of a threat than China, Russia, world war, atomic bombs, or anything else. And Nephi focuses on this in his chapters. And he explains that because of all these false and vain and foolish doctrines, he says, they have all gone out of the way. They have become corrupted because of pride, because of false teachers and false doctrines. All of the churches, every single one has become corrupted. It's these false philosophies in our day that are our greatest threat. And we're all mixed in it. None of us are exempt talking about the churches in our day, Nephi says they rob the poor because of their fine sanctuaries. They rob the poor because of their fine clothing and they persecute the meek and the poor in heart because in their pride they are puffed up. And what led us to this problem? What led us to this problem is false doctrine. He says they wear stiff necks and high heads because of pride and wickedness and abominations and whoredoms, right? Immorality and all of the other problems in our culture. He says they have all gone astray. Save it be a few. He says there are a few who are the humble followers of Christ that are trying to stay out of this. But he says, nevertheless, they are led that in many instances they do err because they are taught by the precepts of men, end quote. In other words, every single one of us is stumbling. All of us have been born into this culture, and no matter how hard we've tried, and believe me, I'm with you. I have tried. I When I get to the other side, at least I can tell God I have tried my best. But you and I, all of us are led to err many times. Why? Because we are taught by the precepts of men. And the Lord understands this. Nephi understands that our culture is so insidious and dark and corrupted that we need a way out. Even when we're trying so hard, we can't find a way out on our own. And the Lord has provided that solution. Again, if you read this chapter in context, the Book of Mormon, the Lord is giving us the Book of Mormon to help break this mist of darkness and these clouds and these false ideas and beliefs that all of us have. When I was growing up, our family would watch many times these two motion pictures on the life of Mother Teresa. And we would watch these because my dad wanted us to be aware of the suffering that is going on in the world and to see someone's life, see someone who had literally given up everything, given up comfort, given up ease, 
to help alleviate suffering. And he wanted us to see that because he wanted us to do the same with our own lives. So we would watch Mother Teresa. And I actually really highly encourage those movies. You can find them online. They're absolutely amazing. Your kids need to see them. You need to see them. Watch them multiple times. I, I, probably seen them at least 15 or 20 times actually by now. Um, But it was really interesting because whenever we were watching them, my dad would pause it as we were watching this. And, you know, part of you is thinking as you're seeing these poor people in suffering, you start thinking, oh my goodness, I got to go get a plane ticket tomorrow. I want to go over to this third world country, forget all of the projects that we're working on and let's get over there and let's help these poor people that are starving and dying. And my dad would pause it and say, okay, Right now, there are millions of people who are dying of famine and disease that are starving to death as we're sitting here, but there are millions more who are spiritually dying, who are spiritually starving, and they need help. And he would, you know, point over to where we had all of our scriptures sitting on the table or on the shelf, and he would be like, you have the answers. You were born in a privileged home where you had access to everything. You cannot sit by while someone else is crying. You don't want to get to the other side and have someone come up to you and say, I lived a life of hell and you knew the answer. Why did you not tell me? So he would tell all of us, all of you guys are Mother Teresa's and you might not be in Africa or in India feeding someone a bowl of rice or bandaging a wound. I mean, you might be, but you also might not. But realize that the way to solve all of these physical problems is by teaching doctrine, helping point people back to the foundation. And that is what Nephi understood. And that's why I think Nephi focuses on this in his chapters when he's speaking to us and he's saying, I have limited room. I have limited time. What do they need to know? You know, there's so many obvious threats in our day, China, world war, economic downfall, wicked political leaders, the Illuminati, this or that satanic cult. But if you look at what Nephi focuses on primarily, he focuses on false doctrine. He talks about false ideas about salvation, and he warns about corruption of the gospel from within. This is the same thing that Jesus Christ warns about in section 33 when he talks to his people. And he says, my vineyard has become corrupted every whit. He says, none doeth good, save it be a few. That's really bold. That's pretty strong. But this is Jesus Christ who is speaking. He knows what he's talking about. And he says, they err in many instances because of priestcrafts. And Nephi talks about priestcraft too. Moroni says the same thing in his day where he says, there are none save a few who are not lifted up in pride. He says, every church has become corrupted because of pride. He says, oh, ye pollutions, ye hypocrites, ye teachers, why have ye polluted the holy church of God? Now, what is the Holy Church? Is the Holy Church the Catholics? Is it the Baptists? Is it the Buddhists? Like, who who is the Holy Church? Well, the Holy Church of God, of course, are those who have the authority and the ordinances, the ones who have the keys. That is us. It's the Latter-day Saints. Now, before you crucify me or slaughter me in the comments, I have backup here from Presidents of the Church, so you can take it up with them. They're the ones saying this. This is President Benson. He says, it is from within the church that the greatest hindrance comes. And so it seems it has been. Now the question arises, will we stick with the kingdom and can we avoid being deceived? End quote. Joseph Fielding Smith iterated the same thing in his day in 1938. This is in his journal. He came home from a meeting where he wrote this in his journal on December 28th, 1938. He said, quote, I attended sessions of meetings held in the assembly hall for the institute teachers held in the assembly room on the fourth floor of the church office building. But I cannot say that I was very greatly edified. Now, remember, this is all the way back in 1938. But even in his day, Joseph Fielding Smith said, too much philosophy of a worldly nature does not seem to mix well with the fundamentals of the gospel. In my opinion, Many of our teachers employed in the church school system have absorbed too much of the paganism of the world and have accepted too readily the views of uninspired educators without regard for the revealed word of God. 
but what to do about it, I do not know. It is a problem for the presidency to consider. Just as a side note, it was President Heber J. Grant, who was the president in 1938, when Joseph Fielding Smith was writing this in his diary. And he continues, he says, It is a very apparent fact that we have traveled far and wide in the past 20 years since his father's death. What the future will bring, I do not know. But if we drift as far afield from fundamental things in the next 20 years, what will be left of the foundation laid by the prophet Joseph Smith? It is easy for one who observes to see how the apostasy came about in the primitive church of Jesus Christ. Are we not traveling the same road? The more I see of educated men, I mean, those who are trained in the doctrines and philosophies now taught in the world, the less regard I have for them. Modern theories, which are so popular today, just do not harmonize with the gospel as revealed to the prophets. And it would be amusing if it were not a tragedy to see how some of our educated brethren attempted to harmonize the theories of men with the revealed word of the Lord. Thank the Lord there is still some faith left, and some members who still cherish the word of God and accept the prophets. Surely the world is ripening for destruction, and Satan has power and dominion over his own. If any are saved, surely the Lord must soon come. End quote. Now, I want to say a few words in defense of Joseph Fielding Smith, because President Joseph Fielding Smith is one of the most hated presidents of the church in our day. He is mocked. He is belittled by so many scholars and professors and authors. It's almost as though his name is a hiss and a byword. But you know what? We wouldn't have a church today, I think, if it were not for Joseph Fielding Smith. Joseph Fielding Smith recognized these problems in his day, and of course, he was the son of President Joseph F. Smith and the grandson of Hiram. And you know what he did? He went to work and he killed himself throughout his life to write books and document pure and true doctrine. His book, Doctrines of Salvation, is absolutely amazing. It was a staple in our home growing up. It was basically like, you cannot graduate from this home. You're not educated unless you've gone through doctrines of salvation because this book is phenomenal. And I highly encourage it for every family out there, especially with kids. Joseph Hilling Smith takes the doctrine and he explains it so simply. He starts in volume one with the Godhead and he walks through the father, the son, the Holy Ghost. He talks about Adam. He talks about Eve. He talks about what salvation is. He explains this is the difference between the Holy Ghost and the light of Christ. This is what covenants are. This is what Israel is. And he just walks through it so simply because he recognized we are in a bad place as a people, just as Nephi saw. We're suffering from false doctrine. Let's fix it. Let's bring true doctrine back and let's correct these false philosophies in our day. And he changed lives. If it were not for Joseph Fielding Smith, I don't think my dad would have ever done the work that he did. And if he hadn't, if my dad hadn't, none of us, myself and my siblings, would not be here today. I I look at Joseph Fielding Smith and I see him belittled and I see him disrespected. But the day will come, you know, President Benson made a statement where he said, those who have the spirit will know that Joseph Fielding Smith's works will stand the test of time. President Benson was specifically commenting at that time about uh, Joseph Fielding Smith's work against organic uh, Darwinism, Darwinian evolution, and his book, Man, His Origin and Destiny. But I think President Benson's statement applies to all of Joseph Fielding Smith's words. And I just want to bear testimony. His books and his works have changed my life. I am so grateful to him. He's one of the first people I want to see on the other side and say, thank you. You helped save our family in so many ways. But it just goes back to this point that Nephi is trying to drive home, that in our day, there are so many mists of darkness. And if we are going to hold fast to the iron rod, part of holding fast is we need to have the true doctrine. We need to understand what salvation it really is. And we need to be able to discern between the false counterfeits in our day. And one of the ways 
One of the primary ways that we expose those false counterfeits is the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon exposes the enemies of Jesus Christ. Uh, President Benson said in his talk, the Book of Mormon is the word of God. He said, quote, the type of apostates in the Book of Mormon is similar to the type we have today. God, with his infinite foreknowledge, so molded the Book of Mormon that we might see the error and know how to combat false educational, political, religious, and philosophical concepts of our time, end quote. Elder Bruce McConkie um, kind of follows this up when he said, quote, the promise of false Christ who will deceive, if it were possible, even the very elect, right? That is a prophecy in the last days that false Christ will come and they will deceive even the very elect. And usually when we read that, sometimes we have this imagery of, you know, like this crazy wild man with long hair and drooling out in the wilderness and like, follow me, you know? Um, and we all think like we wouldn't fall for that. We're, we're too smart. Um, but Elder McConkie explains, he actually says that those false Christ, he says, who will lead astray those who have made eternal covenants with the Lord is a far more subtle and insidious evil. A false Christ is not a person. It is any concept or philosophy, end quote. This is very fundamental. And if you actually look into the Book of Mormon that was written for our day, what do we see? We see Mormon intentionally including specific antichrists like Nehor, Korahor, Amalekiah, um, the corruption within the Zoramite church, um, even Sharon. We'll be talking about Sharon in a few lessons. And But he does more than just highlight the bad. He shows the good to show the contrast. We have Korahor coming on the scene, but we have Alma the Younger combating him, taking him on, and Alma the Younger wins the debate. And Mormon is putting this in there to say, you know what? All of these false ideas that were among the Nephites are going to be in your day as well, just like Nephi says. And everybody's going to get duped by it, even the humble followers of Christ. So we're giving you a book where we're going to show you, here's what the false ideas are. Here's how to combat them. Here you go. The solution is sitting right here. Do we have any idea of the gift that we have. Do we look at the Book of Mormon realizing this priceless treasure we're literally holding in our hands? Well, President Benson said we need to do better about recognizing and, and just feeling gratitude. He said, quote, we have not been using the Book of Mormon as we should. Our homes are not as strong, right? Our this This is affecting our homes and our families unless we are using the Book of Mormon to bring our children to Christ. Our families may be corrupted, right? What's going to corrupt our families? This is what he says. Worldly trends and teachings. And they will be corrupted by those worldly trends and teachings unless we know how to use the Book of Mormon to expose and combat the falsehoods in socialism, organic evolution, rationalism, humanism, etc. End quote. What happened in the Book of Mormon to those who did not listen? who did not um, turn to this inspired counsel, detect the false philosophies, and correct it in their lives and homes, well, they were the ones who were destroyed before the coming of Christ. It was those who listened to the prophets, who did not stone them, who were humble and repented. They were the ones who survived. Do we want, which fate do we want? Which group, which camp do we want to be a part of? God has the way out. In 2 Nephi 29 verse 1, the Lord says, I'm going to do this marvelous work among them that I may remember my covenants, which I have made unto the children of men. Remember, it's all about these fathers and these covenants for Israel. He says that I may set my hand again the second time to recover my people, which are of the house of Israel. What does that word recover mean? Well, if you look up the definition, to recover means to return back to a normal state of health, mind, strength. And find or regain possession of something that was stolen or lost. The Lord is saying, my people, the house of Israel, my covenant people, the ones who love me and want to be a part of my family, they're sick. They're sick in health, mind, and strength. And they've been stolen. They've been hijacked. They've been taken captive and lost 
I'm going to bring them back and I'm going to do that with the Book of Mormon. Now, as we close out this lesson, Nephi just reminds us again and again that, you know what? It doesn't matter what your bloodline is. It doesn't matter how much access to the gospel you have. It doesn't matter how privileged you've been. It only matters if you repent and keep the covenants. In 2 Nephi chapter 30, verse 1, he says, My beloved brother, and I speak unto you, I, Nephi, would not suffer that ye should suppose that ye are more righteous than the Gentiles shall be. Now, I should be clear, he's specifically speaking to um, his people in his day, but those words apply to us as well, I would submit. You know, it can be easy to point fingers and be, oh, this wicked world, and we're victims in this wicked world, instead of realizing no, let's let's be careful and let's recognize where are we going off and how do we turn back and make sure we aren't falling into the same traps. And Nephi specifically says that in the last days, anyone who repents will be brought into this covenant. So it doesn't matter how special you think you are. It matters how you are keeping those covenants. He says the gospel of Jesus Christ will be declared unto them. They'll be restored to a knowledge of their fathers, the knowledge of Jesus Christ, And he says, when that knowledge is restored, the scales of darkness shall begin to fall from their eyes. Now, he's specifically talking, um, if you read this in context, I'm I'm sorry, I'm just pulling out a few excerpts because I just want to drive this point home. If you you go read the chapter, you're going to see Nephi is talking about his children in the last days. Um, which includes, I would submit, many of us, but that's a whole nother conversation. Um, And he's also talking about the Gentiles. He's basically saying whether you're a Nephite, whether you're a Lamanite, whether you're a descendant of Dan, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Judah, whether you're a pure Gentile, like whoever you are, if you're willing to repent, and this is a message that you want, darkness is going to fall. The scales of darkness are going to fall from your eyes. And Peace and healing is going to come. And the context in 2 Nephi is that the primary tool for this is the Book of Mormon. So how do we solve all the issues in our day? The Book of Mormon. And this is something that personally I have felt very called to repentance on. Um, It was probably about six months to a year ago. It's hard for me to remember for sure, just off the cuff here. But um, I I was working one day. And this thought came to my mind, do you really believe that the Book of Mormon could solve all of these problems and these issues in, in your day? And, and I thought, of course, like, of course I do. Of course I believe that. Um, I, I, it's always been easier for me, just personally. I know everyone is not like this, but personally, it has been easier for me in my life. And my patriarchal blessing actually talks about this, too, that when I hear the words of the prophets, I, I believe, like, I just, I, I just get it. Um, it just makes sense to me. And so I'm sitting there, you know, to this question that I feel like the spirit is asking me and I'm like, of course I believe this. But then there was a follow-up question. It was, if you really believe this, what are you doing about it? And if you really believe that the Book of Mormon could turn everything around, what price are you willing to pay to get it out there? And that completely changed the entire trajectory of this period of my life at this time. It's what led to me sitting here today talking to you on this podcast. And when I was going through all of this, especially in the summer of 2023, I remember sitting there on the couch one day and I was listening to President Benson's talk, Flooding the Earth with the Book of Mormon. And I felt a little bit helpless because I felt like I felt like I could feel God was telling me what the answer was and that this would work and that this could save Israel. But at the same time, I felt exhausted. I told God, I was like, God, I do not have the strength. I don't have the financial means. I do not have the time. I do not have the energy to do this. How do I do this? And as I lay there listening to President Benson's word, I received one of the strongest testimonies in my life that President Benson was a prophet of the Lord and that when he spoke in 1988, he was not speaking just as an inspired prophet, but he was delivering the words of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ would have spoken if he were standing there. And this was President Benson's call. 
He said, quote, The time is long overdue for a massive flooding of the earth with the Book of Mormon for the many reasons which the Lord has given. In this age of the electronic media and the mass distribution of the printed word, God will hold us accountable if we do not now move the Book of Mormon in a monumental way. We have the Book of Mormon, we have the members, we have the missionaries, we have the resources, and the world has the need. The time is now. My beloved brothers and sisters, we hardly fathom the power of the Book of Mormon, nor the divine role it must play, nor the extent to which it must be moved. Few men on earth, said Elder Bruce McConkie, either in or out of the church have caught the vision of what the Book of Mormon is all about. Few are they among men who know the part it has played and will yet play in preparing the way for the coming of him of whom it is a new witness. The Book of Mormon shall so affect men that the whole earth and all its peoples will have been influenced and governed by it. My good saints, we have a great work to perform in a very short time. We must flood the earth with the Book of Mormon and get out from under God's condemnation for having treated it lightly. And then I would really encourage you to go watch President Benson, the recording of this talk, because it's profound, um, just to get the full testimony of this. But then President Benson closes, and this really hit me when I listened to this last year. He says, I do not know fully why God has preserved my life to this age, but I do know this that for the present hour he has revealed to me the absolute need for us to move the Book of Mormon forward now in a marvelous manner. You must help with this burden and with this blessing which he has placed upon the whole church, even all the children of Zion, end quote. President Benson, literally, I feel, saved so many of us by doing his work in his day, but now the torch has been passed to us. And as I lay on the couch that day in July of 2023, it was towards the end of July, it was shortly before Pioneer Day, and I was listening to his talk, and I just received this burning testimony of President Benson's words. I remember looking across the room in our family room and looking at the Book of Mormon, and I told God, I said, I am willing to put in faith in you that this will work, and I'm willing to give you whatever you need and whatever is necessary. I'm willing to sacrifice and put everything on the line to do this. And I can tell you that there were so many times as our family was preparing to do this podcast specifically when we wanted to quit, when it was hard and we did not have the time or the resources to do any of this. And thank goodness to my sister, I have to give her a shout out because so many times I would come down and say, this is it. This is too hard. We're not doing this. We're closing up shop. I, I like, this is too painful. And she would say, that is not God. <laughs> it's not inspired. Um, we can do this. We need to have faith. Like, where is your faith? And I'm like, okay, yes, Leah, you are right. Um, but I have literally seen the way open up miracles and you know what? Sometimes it's a day at a time. Sometimes you think, I don't know how I'm going to get through this week. I don't know how I'm going to get through the next day. And then God literally, you'll be, you'll go to bed that night and you'll say, wait, how did that happen? I don't even know how he worked out the hours. Whoa, this person just came into my life and helped with this or helped with that. Like the miracles have opened up and our family is just one of millions. Like we are nothing. We are one small piece in the puzzle. But I just want to bear testimony to you that I know that the Book of Mormon will work. And you know what? Israel hasn't been saved and Zion hasn't been built yet. So you might doubt that. But I have faith and I know that one day, 200 years from now, we're going to be sitting down together and we'll say, you know what? It happened. And so I would just encourage you to get down on your knees tonight or today or right now. And ask God, what is your part in flooding the earth with the Book of Mormon? And you might feel like me, that you don't have the health, that you don't have the strength, that you don't have the time or the resources or anything to do it. But I can promise you, God just wants someone who's willing to try. Huh? He doesn't want someone who's perfect. He doesn't want someone who has it all easily laid out. He just says, 
He just wants someone who is willing to give it their best and he will open the way to accomplish everything he needs to accomplish. As President Benson said, the time is now to flood the earth with the Book of Mormon. It is the small and the simple things that will bring the great things to pass. I just want to leave that testimony with you today and encourage you to take a deeper dive into the Book of Mormon and to do your part.